Welcome back to class. Today we'll be looking at how scientists understand that greenhouse gases are contributing to the warming we're seeing all over the planet. And to do that I want to take a step back from that question and look more broadly at how scientists think about understanding cause and effect. How, for example, a scientist might try and understand how fast a baseball might come off a bat that hit it. So to do that, you'd probably want to know something about the bat, how hard it was, and how fast it was swung, and how fast the ball was pitched, and probably something about the ball itself. So if we understand something about the bat and the ball, and how fast the bat is swung, and how fast the pitch is pitched, we can probably design a math equation that will help us understand what the speed of the ball coming off the bat will be. And that's what's pictured in this graph. So what we see here on the x-axis, the horizontal axis, is the speed of the bat, the swing speed. And that is the variable that will help us determine what the speed coming off the bat will be. And this line is determined by this equation. So the speed of the ball coming off the bat is equal to 1 plus Ea, which is the collision efficiency. And that's a constant. That doesn't change. And that refers to properties of the bat and the ball, how hard or soft they are, times the velocity of the bat plus the collision efficiency times the velocity of the ball. Now in this case, the velocity of the ball is how fast it's pitched. And for the sake of making this simpler, we're saying that all the pitches come at the same speed. If we wanted to make it more complex, we could do the same exercise and change the rates of the pitch. But for the sake of simplicity, we're going to make that constant. And for those of you who are familiar with algebra, this is a very simple equation of the y equals mx plus b formats, which is to say m is the slope and b is the constant. So if we understand something about the bat and the ball, the collision, which determine this variable, the collision of efficiency, we understand the speed at which the bat is swung, and we know the speed at which the pitch is given. We can add all this up, and it's going to tell us how fast that ball comes off a bat. So why am I telling you all this? Well, this is a very simple math model. It's a model of how fast a ball will come off a bat. And when it comes to climate change, scientists rely upon modeling as well. Now, the modeling is much more sophisticated, but the idea is the same. The idea is that we want to understand all of the variables that determine the temperature in the Earth's atmosphere. And we want to put all of those variables together and figure out how they determine the temperature over time. So what does that look like? What are the variables that matter to Earth's climate? Well, there are many. You certainly would understand that the amount of energy coming from the sun would matter. It also matters how reflective the Earth's surface is. So if you have a white surface, that's going to reflect more light than a black surface. Um, it's going to matter how much water is being evaporated off the oceans of the planet. And it's also going to matter how much heat is getting exchanged between oceans and atmosphere. So the transfer of heat between the two. So climate models are very sophisticated. And they require some pretty powerful computers. But the idea is relatively straightforward, and that is we want to understand as best we can how the temperature of the atmosphere can be determined by all the processes that are ongoing on the planet that matter to it. Over time, climate models have gotten much better. In the first assessment report of the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change in 1990, climate models had uh, a grid that was about 500 kilometers on each side so that the Earth's surface was divided into 500 kilometer squares. And at that size, you could get certain predictions about how climate would change over the surface of the planet. But by the fourth assessment report in 2007, that distance had been shrunk to 110 kilometers. So there's a much finer spatial resolution, and that's mostly been made possible by computers that can process a lot more data. But it's not just the surface area of the Earth, and looking at all those variables that were brought up in the prior slide that has gotten more detailed. The atmospheric modeling has gotten more detailed as well, so that in the 1990s there were 19 levels of atmospheric modeling and climate models, and today there's closer to 38. 
so that as we get smaller and smaller boxes to look at in these models, our ability to understand the dynamics of the climate system gets more and more nuanced. So how do we put uh, all of those variables together, all the things that matter to the temperature on the planet together. Well, scientists have tried to find a common language to describe the ability of various things to affect the temperature on Earth. And the term that's used to describe that common language is radiative forcing. Radiative forcing is the idea that everything that can affect the climate can be measured in terms of its influence in altering the balance of incoming radiation and outgoing radiation to the planet. So you remember when we talked about Fourier and the incoming light waves and the outgoing dark rays and that picture of the greenhouse effect, the radiative forcing of any entity, be it a greenhouse gas, the surface of the Earth, is a measure of how much that factor contributes to the relative balance of radiation coming in and out of the Earth's atmosphere. So let's look at the radiative forcing for some of the variables that go into climate models. And that's pictured here. So on the bottom, we have the metric of radiative forcing, and that's measured in watts per meter squared, so it's a watt per unit area. These are various factors that contribute to the temperature of the planet. So there are greenhouse gases, there's ozone, there's water vapor, there's the surface albedo. The albedo of the Earth is how much reflectivity there is, so lighter colored things reflect more than darker colored things. And then there are natural forcings, which are mostly the sun, solar radiance. And what you'll see here for radiative forcing is things that have positive radiative forcings tend to trap heat in the Earth's atmosphere, and things with negative radiative forcings tend to have a cooling effect upon the planet. And the summary of this slide is that carbon dioxide has a rather large radiative forcing that contributes most of the net overall radiative forcing of all of these variables that contribute to the Earth's climate. Another way to look at the same data is how those forcings have changed over time. So that's what's pictured in this graph, and this goes back to 1880. And what you'll see is that solar output is present, but its variability is relatively small over time. That's pictured here in this orange line. And that aerosols, which generally reflect light energy back away from the Earth, um, are largely dependent upon volcanic activity. Each one of these spikes represents a major volcanic eruption, and they have a significant cooling effect. But the overall trend of radiative forcing over time towards warming is from greenhouse gases like carbon dioxide, and that is determined largely by the increase after World War II in industrialization and the rapid increase of greenhouse gas emissions into Earth's atmosphere uh, since that time. So we've seen that uh, climate modelers have a lot to deal with. It's a very complicated enterprise, and yet as complicated as it is, it is a good science. It is a science that has been done for a very long time and continues to get better and has come to understand that greenhouse gases are contributing to the warming of the planet. What evidence can I show you that would be compelling to make the case that greenhouse gases really are doing what the scientific community believes that they are doing in terms of the planet's climate? Well. One way is to ask the question is that if we're able to model the planet's temperature, if we're able to put together the variables that matter to determine the planet's temperature, what would happen if we didn't include in that model the greenhouse gases that have been added to Earth's atmosphere since the Industrial Revolution? And scientists have done that experiment. So these are two graphs, and in both graphs, you'll see a black line, and that is the observed temperature record. That's the temperature record that I showed you at the very start of this lecture from thermometers. And you'll see that that temperature goes up and down since the late 19th century up until the present day. In the top graph is a red line that represents model outputs. So there are several research groups around the world that are doing climate modeling, and in this graph, scientists combined the results from several models and put them together and looked at the models that included human or anthropogenic and natural forcings, the radiative forcings, put them together and said, how well do those models predict the past? Which is to say, if we really understood the dynamics of the climate system well and that our models were working, they should be able to predict not just the future, but they should be able to predict the past. And as you can see here, they do a pretty good job. But what happens when we repeat that experience and we take out the anthropogenic factors? We just do natural factors alone. 
Well, it turns out that around 1960 or so, the observed temperatures continue to go up, but the model outputs do not. Which is to say that the climate models don't predict the temperature on Earth very well if you don't include greenhouse gases. What's interesting is that there has never been a scientifically validated explanation for this difference between those graphs other than the addition of greenhouse gases to Earth's atmosphere. So what science is left to deal with is that we know that greenhouse gases contribute to the planet's climate. We know that we expect that, given what we understand about how greenhouse gases trap radiation, that if we add more, it's going to warm the planet. And then scientists have made models to try and model how the Earth's climate system works, and that when those models do not include the addition of greenhouse gases, they don't actually predict the observed temperature very well. The answer becomes very clear that what's driving the warming is the greenhouse gases that have been added to the atmosphere. So those same climate models that were used in this experiment to look at what happens when you try and model the past climate with and without human factors have also been used to try and figure out what the Earth's climate is going forward. But that's a slightly more challenging task. So the same models that were used in this experiment, which showed that when you remove the anthropogenic forces, including the greenhouse gases, from those models, the models no longer predicted the past, have also been used to look forward and to try and understand what the Earth's climate is going to look like as time unfolds and as greenhouse gases continue to build in Earth's atmosphere. And we're going to look at that science next time. I'll see you then.